so this is a joint work. So I'm going to talk about two recent results. So this is not like a survey or an overview or something. I'm going to talk about two specific results and along the way try to give you some background. Uh, so this is joint work with two uh, students, Biranjit uh, Sesidharan and Gaurav Agarwal. He is a PhD student, he's a master's student. And uh, the recent results have to do, first, the first result has to do with regenerating codes and the second one has to do with codes with locality. And in regenerating codes, the, there is a new construction for an uh, MSR code, which is high rate. And uh, I guess uh, more importantly, because there have been other constructions, it has something that, uh, it has a low alphabet size, and I'll say more about it later. The other one is relates to codes with locality. This is, I mean, I guess generalizations are always welcome in practice, so this is another generalization which I think could be uh, useful in practice. And these are the famous papers that uh, introduce these two uh, fields. Okay. So high rate MSR codes, uh, so I'll just give a quick background on, uh, switch on my local timer here. Regenerating codes are uh, defined in the following way. Uh, so if you have a data file, then data pertaining to that file is distributed across n nodes in the network. One big difference is that it turns out that uh, to make things work, you have to store multiple symbols per node, which another way of saying it is that your code is not over a scalar alphabet, it's actually over a vector alphabet. And uh, one of the requirements is that uh, a data collector who wants to recover the entire file should be able to connect to any k of these n nodes and recover the entire file. The other property is that, uh, which, which is the focus of a lot of attention these days, is that what if one of these nodes fails, then what uh, you should be able to do is you should be able to connect to a sub subset of D nodes. Often D is n minus one, as it is in our, my talk. And uh, download beta symbols. So there are alpha in each node, but you download a smaller number beta and repair this node. And the hope is that D times beta will be significantly smaller than the size of the file. So you're able to repair without by downloading uh, amount of data that's comparable to how much you're going to store, uh, in as opposed to what you do with Reed-Solomon codes, which uh, there is no really very efficient way of doing it. We will assume throughout this talk that uh, node repair is exact. That means that when a node fails, we're going to replace it with an exact replica. Uh, I shrunk this figure because I think the focus is not on the details, but just to say that there is a bound which comes from network coding which tells you how large your file can be. And there are, this can be interpreted, this is a cut set bound, so it can be interpreted in different ways. So one way of saying that is that if you fix k, d, and your file size, there are different parameters, alpha and beta, for which you can actually meet this uh, inequality with equality. So if you, if you have a set of parameters for which equality holds, then you have an optimal code. And uh, we will interpret it in the following way, that you have, if for a given k, d, and b, you have choices of alpha and beta for which you can make this bound hold with equality. So in some sense, there are different flavors of optimality. Okay? And uh, that is also called the storage bandwidth repair trade-off. And uh, so it looks something like this. And uh, what you're trading off is repair bandwidth, d times beta, or the total amount of data download for repair versus the amount of uh, data that you store per node alpha. So here is alpha and that is d beta. And the extreme points are MSR and M MBR. MSR, which is the focus of this talk, is the point where you store the least. It's very efficient in terms of storage, but uh, in terms of bandwidth, this other point is better. But our focus is this particular point. Uh, in terms of constructions for MSR codes, there have been uh, many, and uh, you know a lot of the authors are here. There was one when Rashmi and Nihar were at uh, IIC, they had come up with this uh, product matrix construction. And then there was uh, another paper by Chang-Ho and Kanan, uh, which built on earlier results in this paper. And uh, uh, But uh, both of these constructions were for rate less than or equal to one half. And so there was interest in saying, well, how do you construct codes for rate uh, greater than one half, and they were uh, constructions. So there was one paper which established existence. Uh, there was another paper that constructed it for the case of two parities. Then uh, Tamo, Jing, and uh, uh, Josh Brook actually constructed it 
partially in the sense that they only repaired systematic nodes and then they followed up in a subsequent paper in which they actually rebuilt even the parity nodes. So this is an example of a high rate MSR code. So this does the job in terms of rate, but it has a slightly large uh, symbol alphabet. So, we, uh, so we'll talk about that. So the focus of this talk is how do you actually get the alphabet size down? Small point. They seem the, the dates seem opposite. Is there? Uh, yeah, I put these two together. Yes, I did not uh, order it uh, chronologically. No, I just mean you said that. Uh, but the yeah, the thing is that of course these are publications and transactions, and you have no control over when they actually appear. And for example, this paper has not even been submitted. I know to the. So sub-packetization level or uh, alphabet size. So what is the story there? So this is all about this one. This is all about this one parameter alpha. So you have the number of symbols per node, and the thing is that you'd like to keep that to a low value for practical reasons. And the question is, how small can you make it? So again, I'm not talking chronologically, but there is a bound, which is this, which says that if you take log of alpha to base two, log of alpha to base delta. What is delta? Delta is 1 minus 1 upon r, where r is the redundancy, n minus k. For the MSR case, n and k kind of have the same connotation that they have in ordinary block codes, that k is the rate, k by n is the rate. So it's 1 minus 1 upon r, and uh, this, has, this inequality has to be satisfied. Now, if your delta is uh, you know, 3, 4, some integer like that, then you tend to think that, well, alpha has to be on the order of 2 to the k, so it has to be exponential. But the point is that, well, what if it's not? What if your redundancy, you know, you're talking about rates in practice, which is, you know, we've talked about rate half. What if you're interested in two-thirds, three-fourths, four-fifths, five-sixths, seven-eighths? Then this, this number is going to get very close to one, and this is no longer small, so you can't make that claim anymore. And that's part of the point of this talk. So people were looking in a different direction because they fixed R. Whereas we are not doing that. We're letting R grow with N, but keeping the ratio, the redundancy uh, as a fraction, R by N small. So the construction, so this construction here, which gave us a high rate MSR code, it's a beautiful, beautiful construction, give you alpha equal to R to the K plus one. So in that sense, it's exponential. Uh, present construction gives you alpha equal to R to the N by R. So if N by R, if R grows with N, then that could still, that is still polynomial. So that's the, Thing about this construction. Delta is less than one, right? So log base is a number which is less than one. Uh, R minus one by R, or oh, maybe it's R by R minus one. Okay. I may have got it in right. I think it's R by R minus one. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we can talk offline, but I believe that is true. <laughs> More than yes, the delta is uh, it's very close to one, but greater than one. Yeah, okay. fine. <laughs> Question: so, The units of alpha is bits here? No, it's just symbols over some finite field FQ. So that's another issue. Yeah. Okay. So there is also an issue of what is that Q, and in that construction, Q will come up. Okay. But for so for these, I mean, in general, for the problem, if I choose a larger field size. Then I can always subsume, like, I can always have a smaller alpha, right? Not clear. I don't think it's quite clear. Okay, so are you assuming linear codes? Yes. Okay, so then yeah. Yeah, linear codes. Yes, yes. But this uh, packetization, etc. I think for nonlinear codes is a completely different ballgame. So linear codes, sorry, I should have mentioned that. <laughs> so uh, in the present construction, what we have is alpha is r to the n by r, and there's a parameter in this construction t, so we are able to provide constructions of the form where the rate is t minus 1 upon t, so it's 2 thirds, 3 fourths. And the thing is that uh, the packetization is r cubed, r4, r5. Okay. And uh, so that's uh, just a quick overview of what uh, we will do. So the construction does build a lot on this earlier work. So we'd actually draw a lot of the ideas uh, from this earlier work. So we will, how will we explain construction? So it's a parity check point of view. We'll first present a simplistic view of the parities that we use that will enable you to repair, but will not enable you to handle data collection. Then we'll refine this. Then we'll refine this further and to a point where data collection is also possible. So it's interesting. It turns out that in these cases, by just appealing to a large field size, you can take care of the data collection. It's the repair where you need some topology which enables you to 
handle repair. So that's what it seems to be. This is all, this is a recent result, so it's only about a few weeks of time thinking about this. So the parameters of the particular construction are that n will be t times q, so q is the symbol alphabet, and then uh, k is t minus 1 upon q, t uh, times q, d is n minus 1, so you talk to all the other nodes for repair. Alpha is q to the t, beta is q to the t minus 1, and r, which is n minus k, is just q, and your rate is t minus 1 upon t, and alpha, you can also write q to the t as r to the n by r, okay? So that's, those are the parameters. Now, the notation that we'll actually use in the construction is that, well, we're going to think of each code word as an array, which is, these are the nodes, the n nodes of the network, and each of them is going to store alpha symbols. So this, sorry, it's an alpha by n, uh, not n by alpha, alpha by n code word array. So this is the first symbol in the node, second symbol, last alpha uh, symbol, and so on. And uh, I'm going to show a bunch of equations, but only to give the flavor. Uh, so the code uh, in the array will index it in the following way. L and theta will identify the node, and X will identify the particular symbol within the node. L you can think of as identifying a class or a group of nodes, and theta is a particular node within that class. And uh, so Lth, you talk about the Lth node group, the thetaeth node, and the Xth symbol and uh, L varies between 1 and T, theta varies over FQ, and X varies over FQ uh, to the T. Now, uh, the parity check. So the parity check, so I told you that I'll give you a simplistic viewpoint, which doesn't work, but which will enable you to handle repair but not data collection, then we'll refine it. So in a simple, you can think of the parity checks as just being row sum parity checks, that is when you think about the uh, all the data being stored as an array, then you sum the rows for parity checks, and then you do what I think in the earlier paper was called zigzag parity checks, but I, I just th th seem to feel that you should call it jump parity checks because there's a particular jump that takes place which seems to enable you to do repair. Okay, so the equations are not important, but there is a jump, and I'll illustrate it with an example. So here's an example. So now you have six nodes, so Q is two here. You have six nodes, and we are shooting for rate two-thirds. So you have six nodes here, and each node actually stores eight symbols. Now I'm only showing some of the row, parity, row sum parity checks, so you can see that A is a, represents a row sum parity check, meaning that these symbols uh, are covered by that. So some linear combination of these six symbols will equate to zero. To begin with, we can just assume that all these, the constants are one, but actually you'll need to put in some constants. And that constant we'll talk about later. Similarly, there's a draw somewhere parity check here and so on. There are others, but these are all that are relevant for repair. So let's assume that node one has gone down and you want to actually uh, fix it. So you can see that by taking use of these row sum parities, you can recover A, B, C, and D. Okay, because the sum is zero, so you know all the others. And these, this is what you download from all the other nodes. You download these four symbols from all these other nodes. Okay, so. Uh, beta is q to the t minus 1, which should be 4 in this case. So you download these symbols, and so you can fix that. Okay, so the simple row sum parity enables you to take that. So the question is, well, how do you actually take care of these? And you want to only draw upon these symbols. So this is where these jump parities come in. So those equations are formulated in such a way that the, pari that the parity jumps from this set to this set for this particular node. Here it does some strange thing. It also jumps uh, in a similar way, but you have to reorient, reorient yourself. But it doesn't matter. You still stay within these uh, rows. So the jump parity uh, actually uh, allows you to recover these by drawing only upon those. Okay. So in this way, you recovered all of this. So this is the point. And something like this was also there. I mean, this idea of uh, zigzag parity was there in the earlier paper. Uh, but I think one difference may be that the focus there was on a fixed number of parities, perhaps and focus was on starting with a systematic code, whereas we just say, no, no, there's nothing, no systematic nodes, all nodes are the same. So those are some two slight uh, differences. Okay, so what are the refinements? The refinements are, first of all, you do bring in coefficients, so it's not row sum parities, just doesn't mean you add the symbols, but you scale and add. And then uh, the second thing is that you also need to add some more terms to your jump parity to help you uh, do data collection. Okay, 
So I'll, that is better illustrated like this. So if you took the raw parity checks, that is if you didn't do any refinement, if you just took this, then your parity check matrix will look something like this. And uh, you can see that these are the rows and parity which have a very regular structure, but this is the uh, jump parity which has, uh, where you see this, this thing has jumped here. So the jump looks different when you look at it from the parity check point of view. So the parity check matrix is this section over here. So it looks different from this viewpoint than from the other viewpoint where we were looking at the code word array. Okay, so now on the other hand, uh, it turns out that uh, in order to enable data collection, what you do is you add some extra terms which will make your parity check matrix look like H is H0 plus H1, it is this plus this, and now it's not hard to see using, again, tricks that have been used in the literature before, you can actually select. So I've written I4, which seems to suggest that I put ones over here, but actually not. You're going to put some variables in there. And there is an assignment of variables for which you can show, and I think the bound is uh, N choose K. The alphabet size has to be at least N choose K. You can show that you can actually recover the data by connecting to any K nodes. Okay, so uh, yeah, it is going a little bit fast, but the idea is just to give you the flavor. Okay, so that's all that I wanted to uh, say on this. I'll just pause for a minute if there are any questions. Okay, so then the second one is codes with hierarchical locality, and I talked about this in the lightning talk. So I was giving this talk uh, in, uh, I was giving an overview talk on uh, on codes for distributed storage in the University of Melbourne. And uh, there was one question uh, from uh, in the talk that said that, look, if you have something like this, you have all these uh, locality, and supposing uh, you want to store a very large file, and you want, but you want small locality, then your notion of locality is not really scaling because you know, if you have more errors than this local code can correct, then you have to appeal all the way to this big code, which means that you need to address some 14 symbols. So it's like a big jump from talking to three for local repair to 14 for when the local code cannot work. So can you do, isn't there some way of doing something in between? And I, I guess it should have been uh, obvious that, uh, I mean, I'm not sure why people didn't, uh, I mean, people have talked about hierarchical codes but not in this particular context. So, so the idea was that can you actually put a code in the middle, so to speak, so that you have these uh, local codes and then you have this global code. And uh, so what happens is that if one of these small local codes fail, then you apply, you appeal to what we call the middle code. Okay, these middle codes can help you out. And if they don't fail, then you go there. And it turns out all the theory carries over. And in fact, this is quite, it's not very, difficult. It's you just, uh, I mean, it takes a little bit of effort, but not too much. So you just follow along the footsteps of uh, the first paper, uh, the paper with uh, Gopalan and all, and it follows. And what you get is, so this, now this part over here is the bound on codes for locality, which you can uh, interpret as the singleton bound. Okay, this is the singleton bound, the minimum distance. But then there is a little bit of a loss uh, because you're demanding locality. And here, this is the bound for a code with locality, and because you're demanding this middle locality, you lose some more, and this carries on. Okay. And uh, the proof of the proof is very similar. You try to actually construct a K minus one dimensional punctured subcode having a large support, then the minimum distance can be determined from knowing how large that support is. So. The program requires a little bit of refinement, but uh, a similar argument actually holds. And uh, so, uh, in terms of constructions also, it's interesting that, uh, so there are, I mean, two very general constructions. One is the pyramid construction for codes with locality that back in 2007, Cheng Hong and all had before the notion of locality came. And then there is now the recent uh, Tamo and Barg uh, beautiful construction. Uh, which uses, I mean, there are many different ways of looking at it. You can think of it as using subcodes of a Reed Solomon code. So it turns out that both of those can also be generalized. Uh, there are some restrictions. So, so I'm just going to show you how the all symbol locality that uh, Tamo and Barg had can actually be applied in this case. So uh, I think a key 
uh, element in their construction is to actually think of the symbols and order them uh, according to a cyclic group. So here's a cyclic group. So let's say that you're working over the field of 25 elements. So it has a cyclic group of size 24. So here's the cyclic group. These are This is its subgroup. This is a further subgroup. This is a coset and these are other cosets. So you take a look at it like this. And uh, now what this decomposition means is that the, the elements of this identify the support of the local codes. Okay, so the local codes have as their support these elements. Okay. All right, so, so far, so good. Now, how about the code? So the code, okay, here's another way of looking at uh, the Tamabar construction. Now, you, you want to construct a code which is 4, 3, 2. That means it has block length 4. You want dimension 3 and you want minimum distance 2. So if you restrict your code so that it looks like a polynomial, right, of degree 2, right, then uh, by adjusting these coefficients, you can get dimension 3. And since it cannot, cannot have more than two zeros, you have minimum distance 2. So these, so if you construct your code in such a way that when the code polynomial is restricted to this support of length 4, it looks like this, then you have a local code. And you want that same local code in all of your six local codes. So now you can actually view this as a Chinese remainder uh, question saying, okay, you know what the polynomial looks like modulo the annihilator polynomial of that particular set. And because it's cyclic, it's very sparse. It's x to the 4 minus 1, and that turns out to be important. So modulo this annihilator polynomial, it looks like this. So you can lift it, and these are all relatively prime, so you can lift it here. And then again, you can lift it. Now, but if you do it in this way, then you'll only get a local code. This thing will have only have locality and no global minimum distance. So for global minimum distance, what you have to do is you have to actually pre-code these data, and that's very general, without loss of generality, in such a way that you increase the minimum distance, which means you knock out the higher degree coefficients. And it turns out that organizing things according to groups makes this sparse, and so you don't pay too much of a penalty to knock out higher uh, degree terms and therefore get, for example, if you knock down 22, 21, 20, okay, then at 18, so your minimum distance 6 because the polynomial can only have 18 zeros, okay? So that is how uh, that is done and in fact, that's what happened here. So you had, uh, so if you just lift it, so this is just the raw lifting of the local codes of the polynomial which gives you a locality but nothing else and then what you actually do is you put, you so there are 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18, right? So there are 18 symbols. So what you do is you, I think you just need uh, some equations to knock these down. And uh, so I think you need 4 because you also need to take care of what happens here. So by giving up 4, so you pre-code these, uh, the data that uh, goes into these local codes and use that to kill some of these higher degree terms. And uh, as I said, the sparsity helps here. And uh, that gives you this, and that gives you uh, the code that has uh, minimum distance uh, six, okay? So that's how you can actually get this. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so there's also the, there is a pyramid construction of by, uh, you know, Cheng Hong and others back in 2007, that, that gives you information symbol locality and it's based on actually taking the generator matrix and splitting the columns in a certain way, but that also carries over. But I don't think I'll go too much into the details. Uh, just, uh, I guess, one last thing I wanted to say earlier, but I forgot uh, in the interest of disclosure. So, uh, so the, actually, the construction, the, the, this high-rate MSR construction came from Birinjit, and I think my contribution was that I was, when we were discussing the zigzag paper, I was telling him this is the way you should actually look at the indexing of uh, the parity checks, and that helped him. And the other thing was that I always had this feeling that, you know, the focusing on the fixed number of parity checks doesn't seem right, because, for example, we know that you can construct rate half codes with alphabet size no longer than the block length, so 
uh, it would seem more natural that, okay, for half you need a small field size, for two-thirds you'd need more, and so on. So that also, and that turned out to be true in this particular construction. Can you improve it even further? It, I think it uh, may be possible because if you, if you specialize this to the case of rate one half, you get a slightly larger uh, level of subpacketization than you absolutely need. So maybe there's some uh, scope for improving it. Okay. So I think with that, I'll actually stop. So, so, I, uh, so for, for this MSR construction, so I use the fuel size, so not the separate. Uh, N2K. N2K. N2K is the fuel size. And is there a way to spread it up so to, uh, to get binary fuel but larger, uh, larger separatization? Ah, the, so that goes back to what I think Nihar was also asking. So I, I don't know. Our, our focus was on uh, supply. Yeah. So for the Arachal uh, code, you need chain of subgroups? I didn't understand that. Yeah. So not, I mean, you don't, I mean, a cyclic group always has subgroups, right? So there's no, so for example, here, so, for example, if you take uh, the field of 25 elements, it has a cyclic subgroup of order 20, 24. So, in that, you have a subgroup of size 12, and it's coset, multiplicative uh, subgroups. And this cyclic subgroup, in turn, has a cyclic subgroup of size 4, and it's cosets. So, it comes very naturally. I'm just saying that that is the natural extension of your construction to this case. And the point is that you're just lifting because you know what you want your code word to look like locally. So the question is, what does it look like globally? But that's just the Chinese reminder theorem. And I think you mentioned it. You mentioned something like that in your paper also. <laughs> yeah. So you showed those polynomials at those various levels, right? So you are hiding coefficients. They're not all the same polynomials. Right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. Uh, yeah, we should have put a comma instead of uh, putting a plus. Just the monomial terms have been identified, but not the polynomial. Right. Any more questions? Then let's uh, thank Vijay again and. <coughs>